Doom Squad, 300 years of special forces warfare. We've seen what the modern version looks like. Today, we're going to take a look at the Jaeger era. That's what they call Napoleonics. As you might imagine, the weapons are a little bit different, and we might just see an appearance from the cavalry. Let's take a quick look at the weapons. Muskets only have a range of 12 inches if you're using big figures, centimeters if you don't have a whole lot of space. No real special moves. In this case, a, you need if you want that plus one to fire an aim shot, you're going to have to be packing a carbine or a musket. And of course, if you have a, that's a rifled, I should say, a rifled if you want aim shots. If you got a pistol or a carbine, you may get a plus one in close combat. We haven't seen any melee in either of the two games I've played so far. Let's see if we can correct that. Today, we're going to flip the script a little bit. If you flip past rifleman weapons and stormtrooper weapons, you get to the Jaeger period secure objective, which... You know, if, if, if you're big on the history, General Moore is not retreating towards Portugal and instead has turned towards Salamanca and is taking the British army back into Spain. At midnight on the 11th of December, the village of Rueda, which lay across the path of the advance, was attacked in the dead of night. That's the scenario they have. I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to have, basically, the scenario is going to be get across the board, Secure a building for three turns so you can capture the leadership, you know, beat them up, take their lunch money, get the intel that you need, and then get the heck out. Of, well, actually not get the heck out of there because if you can hold that building for three turns, you'll win this scenario. Since we are getting more comfortable with the rules, we will add in four more figures. Note that each of these squads has a leader. Bing, bong, boom. The guy in the center here with the big white plume, he's going to be our overall commander. He has a telescope, plus one to spot checks. That's pretty much it. I don't have any scouts. I don't have any close combat specialists. I just spent two points for each leader and one point for each of these other guys. And I think that's it. The fellas over here, the dragoony looking guys, they have rifled muskets. They can fire 20 centimeters. They roll one die. And we, I already showed you that. I'm not going to go over all the stats. Uh, but then, you know, again, so each of these units has the leader at least, and each of those leaders can do a free formation change, and the team will ignore the first suppression that it suffers each turn. Oh, that's just this one. I bought a special ability for this guy. He's very inspiring. So this squad ignores the first suppression. Each of the leaders has a pistol and a sword, which will give them additional dice in melee. The enemy units don't have that, so we should be able to outclass the enemies in melee. Because we have 12 figures, we're going to have 12 target markers on the table, and maybe, just maybe, we'll be smart enough to remember to turn over a chance card this time around as well. I've already separated out the chits. I've pulled out the machine guns and the RPGs. I don't know if you knew this or not. They didn't have those in the Napoleonic era, so those are gone. We do have artillery, though, and we do have civilians, so this could get a little bit hairy as we try to move across the table. A little less urban than last time. We're going to do be on the edge of a town and trying to grab a building. Let's take a look. Twelve figures means twelve target markers. They're randomly placed. I haven't looked at them yet. Three rows of four. Keep it even. This is is our objective. If our boys can get into that ruined building and hold it for three turns, we're going to call it a victory. In the the scenario as written, they're rifling it and holding it and, and basically trying to grab intel. For our sake, I think what we'll do is we'll call this a pre-dawn raid. They want to form a strong point, form a blocking force, and if they can hold it until the dawn, that will be fine. It's going to be dark out. That means something very different will happen. Normally, our spotting range is 12 if you're in the open or 6 if you are in cover for the target marker trying to see you. And for cover, we're just going to call basically everything you see on the table cover. The only things that block line of sight are the intact buildings, the ruins, and you can't see through woods at all. But otherwise, you're going to be in cover. In other words, this marker right here We'll be able to see you if you are, and because it's dark, we're cutting that down to 8 and 4. If you're moving past in the open, 
well, I guess this is cover anywhere, right? So if you're moving through this way, it's got a clear line of sight to you. It will see you within eight centimeters. If it's over the hedge, it's only four centimeters. For our guys trying to spot the target markers, it's going to be 16 and eight. Meaning, trying to see over the hedge, you have to be within eight centimeters to take a look at this guy, which of course means that four to eight is where you're going to be able to see him. But it turns out the distance between most of these markers is about, let's see, that's 10 between those. This one's a little further. That one's 13. They're all within about 8 to 16. So we're going to have to figure out how to bring our guys into play. Now, there's no turn limit, which is nice. It means we can take any path we want. And I think given the lay of the land, and, and to, to bring you, you know, kind of pull the curtain back a little bit, I set the terrain up first without any thought to these, trying to make it as interesting as possible. Then I laid out my grid. And of course, you can see I cheated a little bit. This target marker would have appeared in the church, so I had to pull it out. Keep it even. That gives me a puzzle to solve. Creative solutions to problems like these are part and parcel of a solo war game. So I think for our sake, the smart play here as I look at this is either to come up along this way. Oh, but see, we're in the open here. That means the smart play over here for our commandos, is our Jaegers, I should say, our French Jaegers, uh, they, they must be from the, uh, the, the Rhineland, right? That, that, that border between Franco and Prussia. I think the smart play here, we've got space. See, there's, there's our, I keep getting upside down, there's eight centimeters, even in the open. Oh, but you know what? We have these swamps down here. So we have to start somewhere on this table edge. We're going to come boiling up out of the swamp. We're going to be able to walk up along this table edge. And right about when we get here, this is when things are going to get a little hairy. More importantly, I have three units that I have to work with. So what am I going to do with those three units? I don't have to have all three in the building. What I got to do is get one unit in the building and then hold it as all of these target markers come swarming in. I guess I should point out, we're going to have three spawn points. One, two, three. I'll put some markers down just to, no just to nominate which is which. And we're going to have to start checking for those once the shooting starts. And that's going to be a tricky one right there. So we may need to put a squad north of the building to pin that down and make sure nobody comes in none of the enemy comes in along that roadway but our third squad because we'll have one in the building one holding down that entry point and then our third squad where do we put them because these guys are going to start collapsing and i think in the last episode i did things a little bit wrong i think i had only the fire from my crews would awaken targets within 24 centimeters and because it's noise, we're going to call that 24 centimeters, which is enough. If, if we open fire on this guy, it's going to summon both of these. And if we get into a firefight in that, that ruins, all, five, all six of these, whichever ones we haven't eliminated already, are going to be wiped out. So we may want to sneak a little peek at this guy, maybe this guy. Maybe we leave that third squad as just like a, a, a roaming force to slow these guys down if we can pin these guys down for a couple of turns that might buy us our third up there our figures all start the game in the bottom right corner and have already set it up these two files have already moved i started them within six centimeters of the corner and these guys have moved twice the the Dragoons and the Standard Squad with muskets. By the way, there are additional rules for how cannons work. And of course, muskets take a, I think it's a full turn to reload. Or is it carbines? We'll go over that as it happens. The leader, however, has only moved once. He is going to use his second action. He has a straight line of sight. It is 10 centimeters away. So that means he is able to spot this target marker the target marker can only see eight. These guys are not paying nearly as much attention. They are raw recruits compared to our elite commandos. That means we roll a D6 for the spot check. With the telescope, our overall commander has a plus one. On a five or a six, we will reveal this and the nearest target marker, which conveniently enough is this one over here. On a one through four, we will simply reveal that target marker. Now I'm going to flip that over. 
enemy to the left. And that means that when this is triggered, a new enemy will appear to the units, the, the rules say to the unit's left. I'm going to rule that's to the left of the unit that has spotted it. However, by the time this gets flipped over, if it gets flipped over, we are going to be deep into this game. So left might change. If our boys are over there, left is going to be that way. Whereas now left would be this way. At this point, two more turns have elapsed. And you can see our dragoons, they're planning on marking, marching straight through these woods. They'll be, because they're in cover, they can't be seen by these two target markers unless they get to within four centimeters. They can split the uprights and get just to the edge of the woods. It's going to be a little hairy when they come out of the woods, but we'll worry about that in a minute. Our leader with his telescope can stop not at the edge of the brush. He's still inside this little copse of trees. And I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but standard war game rules apply. We've got these the trees that are on the templates. These are small copses of woods. The trees that are standing alone, those basically block line of sight. He is now eight centimeters away, which will allow him to sneak a peek at this target marker. We roll a d6, and on a one, he fails. Ah, but we're at plus one, so we can't roll anything less than a two. We get a four, and we can find out that this is an enemy unit. So I'll flip it over just to remind myself what it is. And we are going to have to move in a different direction. Now, our figures have to snake as they move through the... Well, a couple of things. Because they're all in column march, they get a couple of extra centimeters of movement but they have to stop when they reach the edge of the woods. That's what these two have done. Actually, they haven't yet. They're going to have to use their first action getting to the edge of the woods. They're only going to be able to move five centimeters. He is moving out of the woods. He'll be able to move 10. So you'll see shortly that he's moved a little bit further. Which brings us to this situation here, where these two units have only really moved about six centimeters, even with the bonus, because they had to stop at the edge of the woods. You can see that we are beyond 8 centimeters. I can drop the ruler down. Our angle's a little weird, but I think I think that proves that we're somewhere closer to about 11. Of course, our leader can see 16, and apparently it telescopes give you night vision during Napoleonics. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We roll a 5 this time, which means you reveal this marker and the one nearest. Well, I think the one nearest is probably here, so we're still only going to get the 1. And it is going to be no target. Ooh, that's really convenient. That's going to allow us to really take our time and set up. Now, some people might say, well, that seems pretty cheap, man. You get to just decide whatever you're going to do. Yeah, you do. You know what? This is part of being infiltrators. It's nighttime. They're not expecting an attack. They're kind of sleepy. But once the alarm is sounded, things are going to get hairy. All hell is going to break loose. The good news is we can get into that building, but there is at least one target marker within four centimeters. They're going to spot us. So we got to figure out what to do with those guys. Another turn of movement brings us to this situation right here. And the leader of the dismounted dragoons, he's close enough. He can take a peek at this target marker right here. And we roll a d6. We get a six. And the nearest marker... Wow, that's convenient because I think the nearest marker, 12... 16, 12, yeah, it's going to be this one. So this marker is going to be enemy cavalry, which is probably the worst result possible for us. All right, that's going to dramatically change. Now, that cost an action for him to sneak that peak. This target marker way back here is going to be an enemy strength, which does something... It gives enemy units plus one to their defense saves. Remember, the game is roll to hit, roll to defend. And it says when it's first revealed, which it hasn't been revealed yet. We've identified it, but it hasn't been revealed. That enemy cavalry just got a lot stronger. We might lose this game. It wouldn't surprise me. But at least we know. So... He had to move up to that position uh, to, to identify those, and now I can decide what to do with these guys. I think what that means is I'm still going to go ahead and use this unit as my blocking force. I'm going to move them under cover of the building to get as close to this spawn point as possible, and we'll bring our leader up behind the building as well. We're going to throw the leader into the building and then use these foot dragoons 
to try and draw aggro from the enemy cavalry, and then we can jump into building that. May be the only way to do this. The dragoons form line. That's going to put them in much better stead for combat. The other two squads move up in file. I'm going to move them again. And I'll get these trees in the right place as well. We're almost there. On this next turn, when we jump into the building, I think it's going to take us... Uh, it, essentially, there's a couple of things are all going to happen at the same time. Our leader is going to enter the building. And these guys will form line, and they can wheel around just a little bit. Now, they are further than 8 centimeters away from the, this enemy strength. So normally, this enemy strength, if we were within 8, in fact, we have just a little bit more movement. We can move them 4 centimeters. So we'll put them just like that. So we don't have to worry about this spawn point. They are too far away for this enemy strength to be revealed. These guys can move up and get nice and tight on the enemy cavalry and draw them away, but we need to draw them away for a little while. And it, and it recurs to me that the, one of the things that happens with enemy cavalry is if you are infantry and you are not in cover, when you get charged, the enemy cavalry roll two dice on their attacks. So depending on how many are here, like if we roll six, I'm going to have to drop six enemy cavalry down they're going to come barreling at you. They're going to roll 12 dice. 12 attacks is terrifying. Uh, excuse me. It's three attacks if you're in the open. 18 dice versus two dice per figure if you're in cover. So we definitely want to be in cover for this. So we'll form line back up. We're, we're in cover, but we're, we're forming line. That's going to help us out. And then these guys are going to enter the building. And that's going to put them within four centimeters. And we'll just scatter them about. Uh, the, the rules for buildings are a little, little bit loose. But the good news is they are behind hard cover. So it's going to be difficult to dislodge them. Because they moved in, I don't think that counts as the first turn. Yes, it's three turns after you have occupied it. Which means the clock starts on the next turn, but we've only done our half of the turn. For the enemy half of the turn, we have to go down a little checklist here. The first thing you do is test for target marker reaction. All right, as I said, the enemy cavalry get to test for their reaction. Because we are within four, there is a chance that they spot us. Nope, I got that wrong again. Target markers will automatically be revealed during the player's phase of the turn. It also tests if you are within its observation range and it hasn't yet been revealed. So that may be the case. Uh, first, we'll check. So we, we move these guys, we move those guys. Then we have then our leader piles in and we check on our side of the phase to see what happens. We roll a d6 and on a result of a 5, the marker is revealed. Now, if you roll a six, the marker is not revealed. And that's when you check for any marker within observation range. They have a second chance of spotting you, but that's not the case here. So because this is enemy cavalry, the first thing we do is roll to find out how many enemy cavalry were patrolling as we came along. Just one. Man, we really dodged a bullet that time. Hmm, he must have been coming back from his mistress's house. Bear in mind, we are nine centimeters away from this enemy unit. They don't trigger yet. Cavalry operate under a different set of rules of AI, if you will, different algorithm. These guys are armed with carbines, which means their response will always be to open fire with their carbine at the nearest unit that is in cover, unless there is a unit in the open that they can charge, which there's not. So he's going to take a shot. Kapow. Hey, there's, there's shadows. And for that, because he's got the carbine, um, I wonder if we do still need to roll for his enemy unit reaction. Um, maybe that's the best bet. Uh, two to figures, two to five figures fire. Uh, it would be four in this case. Cavalry would charge toward the nearest Doom Squad figures. That's not the, that's not what it says in the 
Jaeger specific ones though. It says they will either engage the nearest with fire from their carbines if they're in range and in cover or difficult terrain for horses. Yeah, so this is actually going to be just, he's going to open fire. Now that number four means that he, who will he aim? I don't think he will. A carbine in the Jaeger era is going to be a plus one in close combat. It's got a range of six. He's going to be a minus one. That's a three. That means he missed, but something terrible happens. But you, because he fired, maybe we should check for any target marker that's within 24 centimeters. Except that in the enemy phase, first you test for the marker reaction. Then you test for the unit's reaction. So first you test to see what these things do. Then you test for the deployed figures to see what they do. Then if you have anybody in Overwatch, they can fire. Then the enemy troops move and fire, which is what we just finished. The last thing you do is test for the spawn points to see if a new target marker arrives. You only check spawn points that are within 24 centimeters. That ain't us. I think what that means is we get one free turn here. So we can open fire on, but I don't think we want to open fire on this guy with this unit over here, given the strictures present on firing units. We will fire with these three figures, pa pa pow, at this guy. I have three gentlemen that have weapons that are within range, unless, does my leader's pistol have a range of, what do we got? It's, uh, the pistol has only a range of three centimeters. It is too far away. We said that it was for it. So I'm just going to roll for the three muskets that are in there. Normally, our experts hit on fours. They'll take the full turn to aim. That means they're going to be hitting on threes. I roll a total of, okay, now because we aimed, we get a suppression and we get a kill. So I have to roll for each of those. Our cavalryman is in the wide open, which is bad for him. He's going to have to make his saves. But I almost forgot, it's nighttime. That means you get an extra two dice for saves. Oh boy, it says here at nighttime, when you make a defense save... All right, so I get to roll 3d6. If I get a six, we ignore the suppression. We do not. So he is at a minimum suppressed, and then he saves the death hit on a fives and sixes. So we don't save any of those. And that cavalryman, unfortunately, he has sounded the alarm, and that is going to put these guys out of ammo. I'm going to drop a little marker down there just to remind myself. And I think everybody else is going to wait right where they are at. These guys could wheel, but I'm going to go ahead and keep them in cover. Those carbines don't have a great range. You know, in retrospect, I probably should have put the carbines up over here and the muskets down here because those those muskets have a range of 12. No, that's right. These guys, I'm sorry, carbines. These guys are carrying rifled muskets. They have a range of 20 centimeters. I did it right. I know what I'm doing. But with nobody else, I guess I could wheel these guys around just a little bit more for their second action. And they're going to be within eight. They're going to trigger this enemy strength. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to put a little, let's put a little black die on that. Because it's for this turn and next. A little, little O. Just to remind me that anybody, now these guys can fire in the front 90 degree arc. So this direction. And that little, zoom out, just a, just a scotch. So remember, anybody that comes at us. Uh, we aimed, we fired, we moved, we're, we're holding our position, we're staying hidden. I, I think we're going to be okay. This is the first turn. This then brings us to the enemy's turn, and we start by checking all of these target markers. Now, the marker way over there is beyond 24 centimeters from where the gunfire occurred. We don't have to check for that. This enemy strength, the extra armor, didn't do the cavalry man any good, but it might do one, two, three three markers some good for each of these three markers being as they are within 24 centimeters there's your measurement right there uh, 24 looks a little something like that we have to roll a d6 and on a one it stays face down on a two through five this enemy unit that many troops will arrive and on a six not only do that many enemy troops arrive we draw another chit 
and place it right next to the first one and we roll again. Two is the most. So let's start here and find out how many guys appear on a two through five. So a pair of enemy soldiers are here and over here we roll and I'll roll on camera. Whatever it is, that's a three. And for this one, we have another three. So that makes it easy. We have an enemy strong point and we have a cannon. The artillery appears and apparently they were guarding this road, the road that the, the British, the French were expected to arrive on. The enemy strong point is moved to the nearest unit. That is going to be the cannon. It's about 12 centimeters. It's more like 15 to these two guys. What that does is uh, it, troops have found a good position from which to fire. Uh, let's see. As long as this unit doesn't move, this cannon has its range increased by 12 and firing is at plus one to hit. If the unit moves from that point, this is removed from the table, which I think they're going to do. But before we take the, the enemy's turn, we have to roll for their reaction. And that means rolling a d6 for each. We'll start with these two guys. And on a result of a 2, they fire if they are within range of the enemy. So let me move that over here. And then the cannon will roll for him. And we get a 4, which is... If the unit is out of range, it will advance one move and can fire if the unit moves into that range. I don't think that's the case for artillery, though. The enemy infantry will fire if they're within range. With muskets, they have a range of 12. They're going to have to get up into this area. But because of what we rolled, they will advance. And enemies move under slightly different rules. We don't worry about formations with them. We average out how fast they are. They are on foot. We're just going to move them six centimeters. And because it's all averaged out, the cannon operates under the same rule. It's going to move six centimeters. And on this turn, it's going to pivot. So like I said, we're going to get rid of the enemy strong point. We'll put our crew right here. And then that's going to be it for this turn. So glad we get the chance to use the artillery. Because we're playing a tactical game, we've simplified a few things here. They move at the same speed as the infantry, as I just said. It only has a range of 12 centimeters because it's going to be firing grape shot. It's not blasting this to smithereens. Remember in the scenario, this is a headquarters and they don't want to risk injuring their own men, right? So that's all they're going to be able to do this turn. And that will end the turn. We're doing great. But I'm going to leave this on for, let's see, is that the case? I think this is the end of the turn in which this was revealed. So I think on this next turn, that's where our armors for all of the guys are going to go down by one. We opened fire on that cavalry and wiped them out. And then they went. So we've got our first turn out of the way here in the building. If I can remember, after this next turn, we'll draw a chance card basically between turns two and three of holding the building. As I said, we are moving on to our turn. We get to decide what to do. The guys in the building will reload their weapons. That's all they're going to do. Because loaded weapons are way more effective in, uh, what do you call it, melee, in close combat. These guys can only fire to their front, so we are going to leave them as is, I think. We maybe we could wheel them a little bit, turn to face, change formation, but by moving, or or maybe we should just let's do a melee. Let's run into close combat with these guys. You roll one d six, hitting on fours for our guys, and one d six for each figure, hitting on fives for their guys. Because our fellas have carbines and a pistol, in the case of the leader here, pistol and sword, we get one extra dice for each. So we're going to be rolling eight dice. They're going to be rolling two. Hey, we're elite warriors. I'm going to roll two black dice for them. Let me re-roll this. And they get boxcars, which is not great for us. They're going to do two hits. And we are going to do a total of six hits on them. So they have to make a defense save. Now, these hits are all killing hits. Unlike shooting, 
where you have a chance to be suppressed. Here, uh, that's not the case. Uh, our guys are going to be making their saves. Well, everyone is in the open, so everyone is making their saves on 5-up. These guys are in hard cover. That means if, if you charge them in melee, they're making their saves on like a 3-up. We get a 6 and a 3, which means we will lose one of our figures. I'm going to roll 1 through 4 to figure out exactly which one. And uh, on a 5 or 6, I will re-roll. On a result of a 5, on a result of a 2, it's this guy, our leader, has survived. I will just button them up just to keep them close. Now these guys, as I said, are saving on 5s, but oh wait. Remember, for the, they get a plus 1 to each of these rolls. They are now saving on 4s. And so they fail two saves, and that means they will suffer two kills. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Now, we have done more gunfire, and that's going to be a problem for us. That is the only combat we have in this second turn for us. Because of the noise, we have to pull back here and take a look at this marker over here. Enemy to the left. I have to roll to see if it is triggered. And with the result of a 5, it will be. And when it is revealed, this gets taken off and a new marker drawn at random appears to the left flank. It's to the right as we look at it. And I randomly drew, oh good, more enemy cavalry. That's just what we needed. The enemy strength, oh, wait a minute. They appear, so our, go, our boys went into combat. We tested for the noise. These appear, and we immediately find out what they do. Well, first of all, there's going to be D6, five of them, D6 of them. So we get five cavalry, and then at the end of this turn, the strong point goes away. That's a lot of horses. We test for the markers that just were revealed this turn first. Roll on the standard D6, and on the result of a six, the unit will advance... And not fire if it has no suppressed figures. Uh, cavalry will not move towards the enemy and will not fire. You, so apparently there were some horsemen on the flanks over here that heard the sound of gunfire, raced to it, and look, on a six, cavalry will not move toward the enemy and will not fire. They will knock over a tree. I'm really bad at that. Well, that's, that's it. That's not it for turn number two because we also have to figure out what's going to happen with Mr. Cannon over here. He is not within a range of 12, so they will move up an additional six centimeters to here, and they are now just on the edge of being able to attack. I'll pull this up here. And that means, but because the artillery moved, remember we're averaging everything out. Oh, I got actually, I have to test to see what they do, don't I? I gotta roll that D6. And on a result of a two, it says, uh, two to, let's see, two to five figures fire. If it's out of range, it will advance one move and can fire if the unit moved into range. So that means we may, you're saying there's a chance. So 12 centimeters puts it right there at the edge of the windows. I don't think they can, but I'm a fair man on a one, two, three, they can fire this turn. They're only going to get one shot off. And with a result of a one, they're going to go ahead and blast away. This might be the only shot they get off because these guys are going to charge up and start plinking away. As I said, grape shot works a little bit different from other shooting. Oh, oh, wait, wait for it. These weapons can only fire aimed shots, which means the player will have to score a one on the enemy reaction test for the gun to fire. So I guess these guys are trying to, going to try to wheel up one more time. That is the end of turn number two. We're in really good position to win this game, which means I'm going to do something dumb. Uh, not dumb. I want to show you how this full game operates. So we're going to now turn our attention to the event cards. And I'm going to do this a little bit different. I didn't print these up. Normally, you'd put them in a hat. I'm going to roll a white die for the column. And that'll be in a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the D6 for the row. So I got a 1 and a 4. That means we have first column, close air support. Oh, wait a minute. That doesn't really work, does it? Let's roll again and see if we can find something a little more appropriate. With a four and a five, we get artillery support. Eh, that could work. 
On the other hand, both of those cards only work in World War II and modern games, so we're just going to ignore it. The universe is trying to tell us something. Don't use the event cards. Enemy strength goes away. No more bonuses to uh, defense rolls for the enemy. We've only lost one guy. We're doing well. I think we're going to win this game. There's no enemies that can get close enough to do any damage to us. I am going to reload my Dragoons. They've done what they needed to do, and I'm done. I need these guys. Maybe we can bring them up a little bit more in line and get ready, but ultimately, we should be able to get through this turn without any issue. The enemy will go, and we'll roll for the cannon first, because that's interesting. We did not get a 1. If he did get a 1, they're going to fire an aim shot. Oh, the, re the reaction here is going to be move up to short range, and then fire if you can. But we needed to roll a 1 in order to make that cannon shot, so that's just not going to happen this time in this game. If we had rolled a 1, we would have fired, and then you roll 4d6, plus 1, you're hitting on 4s, so pretty, pretty rough attack. And on the building you're going to have saves at, I don't think I've even mentioned this yet because we haven't done that, in hardcover, you save versus suppression on a 4-up and you save versus kill shots on a 3-up. So the cannon couldn't do anything. The only other unit left on the table is this one right here. And the cannon didn't fire, so we don't even have any other units that might appear. The cavalry will roll a d6, and this time we get a 1 for the reaction and on the marker, cavalry will charge toward the nearest Doom Squad figures and will all fire before contact, if in range. That means they will advance 6 centimeters to here, which should put them within range. Remember, the enemy forces follow different rules. Uh, I guess we're not going to be able to see how terrifying they are. If they are within 10 centimeters, they will be able to make, take their shot. They are. They're firing through the light woods, so we'll give the Dragoons light cover. Again, this is a skirmish game. Some of you guys are going to see this and think, wait, 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 your cavalry is charging through the woods, and you're getting all puckered up. Just take a deep breath. Remember, this is all just kind of, uh, you know, abstraction here. These are fairly cleared grounds. The horsemen can move through in short order. Uh, they can't charge. They're not close enough for that, but they can at least take their shots. So they're going to get to fire four times. Now, if they had charged, then because the Dragoons are in the open, each of these five figures would roll three attack dice. They're going to They're just going to completely churn these guys into a bloody mess. Uh, even if these guys were in the woods, so both of them are in soft cover, the cavalry would still be rolling two dice per attack. So that would still be 10 versus, well, they reloaded their carbines, so it would be 10 versus 6. That could be nasty. But as I said, that's not the case here. Instead, what we have is four carbines being shot. These guys can also fire and then move into combat if we'd rolled for the, you know, basically the one was the best we could have hoped for. On a 2-5, to five, they would have charged, which I think we would give them the double movement because they're cavalry. Be that as it may, they're going to score two hits, and our guys are going to save on, is it five ups for that? We're going to miss it, whether it's fives or sixes, and who survives? Two, four, six. Number two, so this guy survives, the leader goes down. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's no defensive bonus for being in line. Uh, if we were spread out, there might be, but there's not. And so we have, and that's it. That's going to be the end of the turn. In fact, that is going to be the end of the game. We have lost almost a full squad. But as things stand, we have now held the building for three turns. And as a post-game wrap-up, once again, we took our time. This is This game is solvable. Most of our markers were in the center of the board, and... I think the lesson here is go ahead and push them out toward the edge of the board. All three of these games, we've, they, we haven't had enough room to sneak up through the center of the board. Maybe leave yourself some alleys through the middle of the board so that when things really start popping, more of those tokens will be flipped over. By moving around the edge in this particular scenario, we were able to just completely deny that whole left side of the board. Uh, part of what happened here is that I think the strong point didn't do them any good. Had there been a unit there, we might have been able to flush these guys out. 
if the cavalry had rolled better, if they had been able to charge on the first turn, they would have been in a good position to charge on the second turn and drive our guys out of the building. Even, but I mean, we weren't going to do anything with this with this cannon. But having the cannon in a wasted strong point again, we had three of our six tokens that we revealed. How many are left on the board? Two, four. You know, we we flipped over two, four, five. Oh, we flipped over five altogether, and um, of those five, only three. Well, no, four of them were a threat. It was that bad roll on the cavalry. If that cavalry had rolled five guys, they would have flushed the building out. We would have had a much harder go of things. So, a couple of little swings in either direction, and I think this game could have gone completely off the cliff earlier than it did. As it is, we got very lucky, and hey, you know, it comes to games of chance. It's way better to be lucky than good. Thanks for watching. I think we're going to stick a fork in this one for a little while, move on to some other new games that you may not have seen, and, uh, you know, as, as we've been doing all week with, with some fun little Starfighter games in the dirt, and I don't know. Maybe show you some stuff that you've never even heard of. Check it out. See you in a few days. Till then, I'm praying for you.